Let's see, Maggie and me, this is going back up and up and down. Well, thank you, Maggie, uh, for the invite. I really uh, couldn't be more grateful for the opportunity to come share some of the work that uh, me and my research team up at Utah State have been working on for a uh, better part of a decade now. I kind of had this realization as I was putting together this presentation that uh, a large proportion of my professional career now has been built on open data. And, and so I'd, I'd like to extend a, a great thank you to um, the stewards of open data, at least within the OpenStreetMap community that helped make that happen. I'm gonna talk today about two kind of broad general themes uh, and specifically highlight the ways that those themes interact with what we're doing here in Utah. The first theme is relates to the, the power of cartography and mapping in general and who holds that power and how we, we manage the data that we're now generating at a, a phenomenal rate. And the second theme is the way we think about context and in, in how we often, often show and, and demonstrate place uh, in the maps that we create and how the, important it is to realize the power of context. So I'm gonna start off by asking a very simple question that really goes back to the fundamentals of geography and even cartography of where are we? Well, uh, this question could be understood in a and framed in a variety of ways. Where are we physically? Well, this might be the most common way that we think about asking this question. Well, we're in Salt Lake, of course, but that answer only provides any meaning to you if you're aware of how Salt Lake is positioned relative to the physical landscape around it. Um, perhaps you know that Salt Lake is bordered to the east by our Wasatch Mountain Range, which provides uh, almost unlimited opportunities for outdoor recreation participation and an amazing backdrop to the cityscape. But you also might know that we're bordered to the west by one of the world's largest saline lakes, the Great Salt Lake. There may even be a few of you who are familiar not only with the relative physical position of Salt Lake City, but also the meanings of the place itself. You may understand that we're now just a few thousand yards away from where we celebrate where early Mormon pioneers came across and famously declared that this is the place. This is the place that they would receive exile from from the perse persecution that they were receiving as they came across the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains. The point here is to understand that knowing more about the context and the, of where we are, the physical position of our surrounding landscape, perhaps even the, the history and meanings associated with it, the more we know about our position in the world. With little information about where we are, it's easy to become complacent and perhaps even ignorant is a better word about the future of that place and our actions within it. Why do you care about the places where you are? Why should you even care about that place? Well, there are probably some of you who are for coming from thousands of miles away, perhaps even another country, and it's e easy to think that you might not care about this place, given you have very little knowledge about its relative and its rel relative distant connection to you, your life and the things that you value. But the same can be said for why I should care about the distant places that you come from. But if I told you that the large saline lake to our west has been gradually receding over the past several decades as precipitation becomes more variable and evaporation rates increase as warming temperatures also do, that right now the state research teams and many Utah residents are clamoring to find a way to get water into that lake. Because if there is no water, there's a very real likely scenario that toxic dust storms fueled by a dry lake bed will have immeasurable health and economic consequences for the Salt Lake Valley. So perhaps knowing that, you may care a little bit more about this place. Perhaps you might even change your own actions um, within the place and how they affect our future. So place certainly matters, but place within context matters a lot more. I'm gonna highlight how this has happened uh, in how we've mapped the American West. Um, we can think about who provides this context. Who provides the critical meanings behind the maps that we all use to answer this question of who are we or where are we? Well, it's many people and organizations. The state is obviously at the top of the list. And the state, by which I mean the federal and state government, has done an exceptional amount 
in providing the foundational understanding of our physical geography that surrounds us, specifically regarding our understanding of the physical geography of public lands in the Western US. Almost all of our foundational understanding stems from early expeditions funded by the federal government or private companies looking to chart new transportation and supply chain routes across the West. Consider one of the most notable expeditions which created the first Anglo-American maps of the frontier in the 1800s. The Lewis and Clark expedition in the very early 1800s was commissioned by President Thomas Jefferson in the US Congress and included soldiers, conscripted translators, and most famously a Shoshone woman, Sacagawea, who provided invaluable guiding services and negotiation services to, to the expedition. Many could argue that she is one of the first voluntary cartographers of the American West, as she was never directly compensated for her efforts in the expedition. But this is a complex discussion, as the term voluntary within the context of the 1800s is often intertwined with religious service, non-consensual relationships, such as the one Sacagawea had with her husband, and indentured servitude. Geographic data collected through the expedition provided the first accurate depictions of relationships between the sources of the Columbia River in the Midwest, excuse me, the Columbia River in the Pacific Northwest and the Missouri River in the Midwest. Although the effort became, through the effort it became clear that there was no navigable water route between the Atlantic and the Pacific, spurring major investments in subsequent transcontinental railway expeditions. But in addition to this knowledge, the expedition also charted the locations, sizes, and resources of many Native American tribes in the Pacific Northwest. This cartographic knowledge had obvious disastrous consequences for the future of those tribes years later. Again, the lesson here is that cartographic knowledge yields incredible power, and that power should be used wisely and for good whenever possible. The power generated by cartographic knowledge is also very apparent when we look at the private companies that funded expeditions across the American West. Often, these were done to map and facilitate the extraction or transportation of natural resources. We can look at the early efforts of, to map the West for the sole purposes of developing a burgeoning fur trade. The Hudson's Bay Company, the Northwest Company, the American Fur Company, and the Pacific Fur Company were just a few of the private corpora corporations that put significant amounts of private capital into mapping the American West. They were successful, so much so that they were almost too successful. Their efforts led to the overhunting and near extinction of many fur-bearing species, such as beavers, otters, and buffalo. So again, we, we see that cartographic knowledge is an incredible power and that we should learn from these lessons of the past and that that power should be used for wisely and for good. I think here there's an interesting analogy that can be drawn from these examples in the past of early cartography funded by either federal government or private businesses and the current efforts to develop a seemingly limitless geospatial understanding of our physical world. Many of you are actively working to cultivate, manage, and leverage data that can be used for the benefit of the businesses that you work for. This is great and absolutely should happen. But we should also heed the lessons of the past, acknowledge that cartographic knowledge yields incredible power, and that that power should be used for good whenever possible. Open data platforms provide an avenue for this to happen. They allow data to be used for purposes beyond the primary motivations of the companies who collect them. For example, scientists can collect data on human mobility to understand how we use our parks and public lands. Analysts can use data on human preferences and needs to identify where public investments in infrastructure are needed. And I'll highlight a few of those examples of how we're doing that here in Utah in a moment. But now I'd like to emphasize simply that cartographic knowledge yields incredible power and that power should be used wisely and good. In the early 1800s, early European Americans were faced with the challenge of mapping the landscapes and the natural resources within them. And today, as geospatial professionals and volunteer cartographers, you are tasked with map make mapping the digital frontier. And we shouldn't forget the ethical consequences of our decisions, and we should leverage open data platforms as much as possible to share resources and allow our data to be used for good as much as possible. So now let's jump forward several hundred years and I'd like to highlight some of the ways that we're using volunteer geographic data to, share, to shape the management of public lands across the US and in Utah specifically. Um, 
You might have noticed I run an institute of outdoor recreation. We're based in Logan. It's about 90 miles north of here, just on the Idaho border. And our work is primarily focused on providing land managers, elected officials, private industry, and the public with a scientific understanding of how to best manage the rapidly changing face of both outdoor recreation participation and outdoor recreation resources. Almost always, this, in, this involves the use of volunteered geographic data, such as the data that are shared on social media platforms or mapping specific platforms like OpenStreetMaps. Well, one of the biggest challenges that federal and state land management agencies face across the country is not actually managing natural resources, such as trees, waterways, and wildlife. All those things act in relatively predictable ways. We know how forest growth and carbon sequestration are affected by wildfires. We know that temperatures, how temperatures of rivers and lakes respond to increases in air temperature. We know how increased competition amongst fish and wildlife populations are, are influenced community and population dynamics. But what is much less predictable are human behaviors. We humans are incredibly variable in our values, our preferences, and our actions. How do we possibly quantify these things at scales that are meaningful to land managers like the National Park Service or the National Forest Service? How do we manage and provide information for these types of agencies that are trying to help visitors not get lost when they go down one of our slot canyons in southern Utah? Or how do we provide a basic scientific understanding of how increased pressures on our aquatic resources our fish and our wildlife um, due to fishing are impacting those species as well. Well, traditionally, we have done that with a lot of manpower, sending students and employees out to trailheads, boat ramps, campgrounds, and other outdoor recreation destinations with the purposes of quantifying who was there, what they were doing, and what they valued about that place. This is a very time-consuming process when you consider how much of the American West is actually managed for outdoor recreation. Across the West, anywhere between 38 to 84 percent of each state's land is managed specifically for outdoor recreation. Almost always, these lands are also managed for other uses, such as mining and timber production. But as the American economy has transitioned away from agriculture and manufacturing and towards outdoor recreation and tourism and, and technological services, our public lands are generating much more value from the recreational experiences that they provide and the recreational enjoyment that they provide than from the resources that can be extracted from them. In fact, several states across the country now have larger proportions of their state economy supported through outdoor recreation than they do supported by agriculture. And there's always one slide in a presentation that you almost can't read. This is that slide. <laughs> You'll see it, in, the, in the chart, I've listed all the states, uh, all 50 states in the US and their relative dependence on either agriculture or traditional outdoor recreation. And now, here in 2023, we have eight states that are more dependent upon outdoor recreation than they are agriculture, at least when it comes to quantifying that through gross, gross domestic product, uh, the, economy, the size of the economy within the state. So many people are enjoying our public lands and sending survey, by sending survey crews out to all the outdoor recreation destinations across the West is prohibitively expensive. But this was our only option up to about 10 or 15 years ago when social media and GPS-enabled smartphones began to become ubiquitous. Many of you might know that all social media platforms passively collect GPS coordinates of their users and the content that their users share on those platforms, obviously. With tens of millions of people running around with GPS-enabled devices sharing their outdoor recreation experiences online, can these data be used as a surrogate for the time-consuming and often expensive task of collecting data in person? And the short answer is yes, and they can do it pretty well. Several pioneering social media platforms who were committed to open data, at least at the time, allowed researchers to access select parts of their data set. We, the scientific community, have been able to quantify how people are using our public lands and public spaces. In some of our earliest work, we use social media data from Instagram, Flickr, and now defunct Google-based photo sharing platform, Panoramio, to quantify the uses of public spaces across continental Europe. Doing this across an entire continent, regardless of administrative boundaries, was transformative in the way that we think about quantifying human use 
of our public spaces, and particularly our public lands. A few years later, we began to focus more specifically on, par on the parks and public lands of the United States. In our applications within the US, we've compared counts of social media shared on those different platforms with accounts reported through official statistics that are often generated through either entrance receipts or visitor, visitor intercept surveys. We found that the most, most, for the most part, these volunteer geographic data were well correlated with the official statistics. Here you see the correlations between 0.5 and 1 for different studies that have evaluated social media, for social media's comparability to official statistics. The data are reported by social media platform, and we've looked at uh, Flickr, Twitter, and a couple uh, fitness-based apps. Okay, so these data are good, at least for telling us what's happening in the past, but can they tell us anything about what's likely to, going, going, what's likely to be happening in the future? Well, we thought it would be worth exploring. Particularly, we were interested in exploring how the demand for outdoor recreation was likely going to change in response to continued increases in air temperature driven by increased concentrations in CO2 in the atmosphere. Retrospective analysis has shown that outdoor recreation participation was increasing, mostly in the northern latitudes of the country where sites shuttered, once shuttered by ice and snow were becoming more comfortable and more accessible during the shoulder season, early shoulder seasons of fall and spring. And thanks to the work of climatologists, we also had a good idea of what future temperatures would look like under different scenarios in which the concentration of CO2 continued to increase. So here you see the map where we've looked at the concentration of social media posts on public lands within the, within the US, just for those lands that are accessible for outdoor recreation. You might see some notable trends. If you can discern some of the, the small hotspots on the map, concentrations in the Sierras, in the high, high um, Intermountain West and Rocky Mountains um, in the summer months, areas around our national parks, which obviously see a lot more visitation for outdoor recreation than other public lands. We can correlate that with our observed temperatures for those same locations to build a historical and statistical model of the ways that temperature has affected outdoor recreation participation at any given point in time. And then we can use that data, that historical relationship, to extrapolate into the future based upon projections of, of future, climate, future climate trends uh, 20 or 30 years out. So we built a statistical model that looked at this historical relationships the historical relationships between social media sharing and temperature on the day that that photograph was actually taken uh, to look at the relationship between, between temperature and outdoor recreation participation. We did this for a variety of different ecoregions across the US because those functional relationships between temperature and outdoor recreation participation are going to be different depending upon which ecoregion you're in. The same five degree temperature increase in, let's say, the upper Midwest might have a much bigger increase on visitation than that same five degree imp increase if it was realized in the central Nevada desert. So after we built this historical model, we estimate relationships between temperature and outdoor recreation and project use levels into the future under different warming scenarios. In our analysis, we specifically looked at scenarios of moderate and high CO2 concentrations. So many of you might be familiar, but for those who are not, a, mo a moderate increase in CO2 concentrations is often re referred to as a RCP or representative concentration pathway 4.5 model and a higher level of CO2 concentrations is referred to as a RCP 8.5 model. And you can see those both represented in here and the findings for the relative positive or negative increase in outdoor recreation participation on public lands across these different ecoregions in the US. And so what did we find? Well, here you can see these projected increases or in some cases decreases in outdoor recreation use by season and by geographic region of the country out when we look out to 2050. What you'll see is there are many regions of the country that will experience declines in outdoor recreation participation in the summer months as temperature becomes uncomfortably warm. We generally see a thermal comfort threshold around 85 degrees Fahrenheit, beyond which most outdoor recreation activities, participation trends generally start to flatten off or decline. Across all continental land, although all lands within the continental US that are available for outdoor recreation, Outdoor recreation demand is expected to decrease by 18% under a moderate warming scenario and 28% under a high warming scenario by mid-century in the summer months. You'll also notice there's a large amount of variation across the regions. Some regions, particularly those in the central US, are likely to see the largest increases in visitation in the summer 
in seasons other than summer. We generally see a trend that regions that are generally have cool climates and a less, less topographic relief see the most notable positive increases in outdoor recreation participation in the non-summer months. Areas with more topographic relief, such as the Sierras, the Air Mountain West, and the Rocky Mountains, will have whatever declines in visitation would be expected in the summer months offset by the, the large topographic relief that is offered within those areas. And this is a phenomenon that we experience every summer here in Salt Lake City on areas, on, on days where the city becomes too hot, people will look for our canyons um, and the outdoor recreation opportunities that they provide as areas for, for respite. And so the visit, negative impact on visitation in the summer months is somewhat mitigated in these areas where there is a lot of topographic relief. You'll also notice um, we generally see a trend, a positive increase in outdoor recreation demand in the non-summer months. Areas where we see more topographic relief, like the Sierras, um, do offer this do offer this opportunity uh, uh, to escape those warm summer warm summer temperatures. So these findings have been used to inform the climate change adaptation planning efforts of several federal agencies, no, notably the National Park Service, the Forest Service, and the Bureau of Land Management. All these agencies has very all these agencies have very limited monitoring budgets which are essential to understanding what has gone on in the past, and they have even smaller research budgets to project and proactively adapt to what's coming in the future. So I wanted to specifically highlight this project because it's an excellent example of how volunteered geographic data can and has been used to produce some very specific ancillary benefits for the users of America's public lands. The developers of Flickr, Instagram, and Twitter had no idea that their platforms and the APIs built into them would be able to yield any meaningful outcomes for how, how land management agencies like the National Park Service and the Forest Service understood and managed their lands. But these efforts did create these incidental benefits. Nobody who, while nobody knows what valuable incidental benefits your data can provide, it is certain that they can't be provided unless those data are open and accessible to as many users as possible. I'm gonna highlight one more example in which we are using volunteer geographic data to shape the management of public lands, this time a little closer to home here in Utah. In early 2020, uh, leadership from the Utah State Legislature convened a group of other leaders from the, across the state who had a vested interest in the management and growth of outdoor recreation resources within the state. This included representatives from the Division of State Parks, the Office of Tourism, and many others. State legislative leadership realized that outdoor recreation had become an increasingly important of our state's economy, but they also realized that outdoor recreation experiences within the state were and still are managed by many, many different organizations and agencies, all of which have different mandates, missions, and orientations. Here's a map of the federal land management agencies that provide outdoor recreation opportunities within Utah. Uh, six major ones are shown, and there's many, many more that do also provide outdoor recreation opportunities. Could the state in some way bring together all of these agencies, all of these different interests in a common vision and build a common vision for the future? Could there actually be some strategy behind how the state was investing in outdoor recreation infrastructure? And the outdoor recreation experiences that that infrastructure provides. Over the better part of the previous decade, the state had gradually increased how much it was funding how much of its funding was being distributed to municipalities, counties, and the federal government to support the development of new trails, boat ramps, campgrounds, and other outdoor recreation infrastructure. In 2020, when we started this project, the state was distributing over $7 million a year in, through one grant program alone for these types of projects. Here you see the, the growth in time over state investments in outdoor recreation infrastructure within Utah through this one, this one specific grant program. But these investments were being made, weren't being made in any data-driven way. Rather, the state was relying heavily on potential funding recipients to clearly articulate a need and justification for the types of infrastructures, the types of infrastructure that they needed or thought that they needed. This obviously has some notable limitations as many of the municipalities within the state have tiny full-time full -time year-round resident, residential populations of but hundreds of thousands, if not millions of visitors that pass through each year. If many of these small outdoor recreation destinations 
in many of these small outdoor recreation destinations, the same person who is responsible for writing grant applications uh, for state funding opportunities is a part-time civil servant who's also responsible for managing waste disposal, permitting, and concessionaire operations at the local Little League, Little League field. And they, also, they might also be wait, waiting tables part-time at a restaurant in town. There surely must be a better and more equitable way to bring some data and structure to identifying where outdoor recreation infrastructure is needed. The legislature, working with a group of, <clears throat> forwarded the idea of developing a strategic plan for outdoor recreation as a whole. The plan would be built on both the best available data and input from outdoor recreation managers and planners from across the state. We, meaning the Institute at Utah State University, were brought in to facilitate the process and develop the plan for the state. What's the first step in developing a strategic plan? Well, it's knowing where you are and the assets that you have available to you. So we did this. We started building a database of all the outdoor recreation assets within Utah. But as I mentioned before, outdoor recreation opportunities across the West, and Utah is no exception, are managed by many, many different agencies. The data from some of these agencies was really good, but often the data was non-existent. Some agencies had data on certain types of infrastructure, while it was completely missing from other agencies. There was no consistency in the un uniformity of that data that it was, it was available, and certainly no consistency in the attributes different agencies were reporting. How could we fill the gaps where we didn't have any data, or less than reliable data, or where trails were, for camp or where campsites were, or any type of other outdoor recreation infrastructure? This would be absolutely necessary if we were going to be able to present a comprehensive picture of the amount, diversity, and location of outdoor recreation assets within the state. So how do we go about it? Well, it might seem obvious in a, in a group, in a forum like this, but we relied heavily on open street maps and the volunteer, voluntarily contributed features within it to fill the gaps left by federal and state land management agencies. We cross-checked OSM features with those being reported by agencies to identify these gaps and then pulled from the OSM database to fill in the features that were missing. This was a great starting point as it at least allows to say that we had some data for many of the features of the state that could possibly, that the state could possibly invest in. But was it all the data? Was that data accurately reflecting what was going on on the ground? We really didn't know. So we asked the people who would. The outdoor recreation managers and planners from munis municipalities, counties, state agencies, and federal agencies across Utah. Almost all these folks have never heard of open street maps and have no idea what it does and how they could use it. In fact, many, in many parts of the state, these individuals don't even have any GIS expertise and they don't have any available to them either. Many, many of the state's municipalities don't have any dedicated GIS staff. Often the county recorder is as close as you can find, so we decided to go an analog route and have outdoor recreation managers and planners actually show us on a physical map where outdoor recreation assets were missing and what might have been recorded in error. Through seven different regional workshops held in the fall of 2022, we asked outdoor recreation managers and planners to see what data existed for different types of outdoor recreation assets within their region. The data on these maps was, comp was a composite of what we were able to put together from the federal and state agencies that did have data and what we had pulled from open street maps to fill the gaps. And these maps were huge. We did seven regions across Utah. We printed them out on eight foot by 16 foot mounted foam core boards that filled almost three, three quarters uh, of, of the size of a room. And we asked people to identify the features on that map that might have been marked in error, the features that were missing, or sp other specific um, characteristics that they wanted to note regarding the needs or, or threats that they saw to that particular type of outdoor, outdoor recreation infrastructure. We chose this method for a variety of reasons. First and obviously, this was a tech, there was a technological literacy of the group. It's a lot easier to explain the task of physically remarking a trail on a big map than it is in explaining how to, do, how to edit a feature in a web map. At least it's easier to do that for several hundred workshop participants. Second, and perhaps more importantly, we wanted individuals' interactions with the map to generate discussion. We wanted people to be rubbing elbows, talking about how a particular trail was overgrown or how a ton of erosion we didn't want to know just where the state's outdoor recreation assets were. We also wanted to know whether those, they needed, how they needed improvements or expansions or even possibly closures. 
Sure, many web mapping applications allow you to achieve the same thing in a much more technologically sophisticated way, but they can they also generate the discussion and debate that, had, that we can have in person, perhaps to some extent, but human conversations and the decisions that they inspire are complex, and we wanted to provide a forum where these decisions and conversations could take place in their full complexity. So we followed this participated, participatory and interactive mapping session with facilitated group discussions about the major threats to, and needs to outdoor recreation infrastructure on the map, which trails were perennial, perennially, perennially blown out because they were just designed poorly, which boat ramps were people starting to avoid because you have to wait an hour in line to launch your boat at that ramp, which lakes and rivers had seen more frequent harmful algae blooms in recent years as, of, as the temperatures have begun, begun to rise. All of this is integral information the state needs in order to make more informed decisions about where and how they are spending millions of taxpayer dollars that are now going to outdoor recreation infrastructure. This is an image of somebody making an edit uh, to one of the features, marking their notes on, them, on one of these maps, and also another image of the facilitated work group discussions that we had afterwards. All the discussion points were negotiated amongst the group to develop a shared understanding of the common challenges and needs being faced by outdoor recreation and managers within the region. Often, a shared understanding is the best we can hope for when brokering these complex, multi-jurisdictional discussions. And like I had mentioned at the beginning of the pre presentation, place certainly matters, but place within context matters a lot more. So the more that we can get context into our maps, the better. So where did this all get us, and where did it get the state? Through subsequent digitization of the workshop participants' edits to the features presented on the big maps, we were able to subsequently analyze and identify where there were areas of significant opportunity for investment in outdoor recreation infrastructure. For example, we found the larger counties of the Wasatch Front, at least when we measure it by population, and that includes roughly four counties, Salt Lake and its surrounding counties, only, they only account for about 14% of the hiking and biking trails within the state despite having more than 75% of the state's population within them. So this is a signal for a need for more focused investments in hiking and biking trails throughout the Wasatch Front. We also found that some of the state's most populous counties have very few developed campgrounds. For example, Salt Lake County, where we're at now, has six, and Davis County, to our north, has five. This can be interpreted as an opportunity for strategic investments in more urban proximate campgrounds, as the analysis suggests they're in limited supply. So our team was also able, able to identify unique threats, needs, opportunities within each region by aggregating all of the notes generated through the facilitated discussions. And these were reported back formally through a report which was shared with the outdoor recreation managers and planners within the region. And the report was also shared with the state legislature who can subsequently take action through subsequent legislation the report was also an integral component of our larger statewide strategic plan, which was released in the fall of 2023. Here you see Governor Spencer Cox making a few remarks about the value of outdoor recreation and the need for a strategic plan. One piece of legislation that's already manifested itself through this process was the formalization of regional working groups. In the 2023 legislative session, the state mandated the Division of Outdoor Recreation to formally set, set up regional collaboratives to update and collectively address the needs identified in our regional strategic planning workshops. These are perennially funded working groups to turn the, states, the state's strategic plan into a, a reality. The development of Utah's outdoor recreation strategic plan and the many, many valuable interactions that will be facilitated as part of our workshop series would not have been possible without the volunteer geographic data that was being, being built up in open street, map, street maps for nearly two decades. Is the data perfect? No. Is the data comprehensive? No. But was it able to fill the gaps that have resulted in our state and federal loans being managed in such a patchwork and piecemeal fashion? Absolutely yes. The examples I've highlighted today are just a few from my own program's work on the incredibly powerful role that volunteer geographic information is playing in shaping America's public lands policy and outdoor recreation in Utah specifically. There are many, many more examples that are just as good, some of which we heard about yesterday in our sessions and some of which we'll probably hear about later today. 
Just a few concluding thoughts to tie this all together. First, cartographic knowledge yields incredible power, and that power should be used wisely and for good. The companies charting the digital frontier today can learn from the companies that charted the actual frontier several hundred years ago. We shouldn't forget the ethical consequences of our decisions, and we should leverage open data platforms as much as possible to share resources so that our data can be used for good as much as possible. Second, place certainly matters, but place within context matters a lot more. With little information about where we are, it's easy to become a complacent about the future of that place and our actions within it. With the knowledge of how important the Salt Lake, the lake is itself, to the city, we can begin to take actions to mitigate future environmental harms. With the knowledge of how outdoor recreation participation is going to change in the future under different warming, different levels of warming, agencies can begin to proactively make adaptation decisions and actions in response to those warming temperatures. And with knowledge of where outdoors, Utah's outdoor recreation assets are and where critical investments are needed, state leaders can begin to take strategic action. So place certainly matters, but place within context certainly matters more. These are just a few of the examples in which we've been relying heavily on OpenStreetMaps and, and other open sources of data uh, to build a scientific understanding of how to manage America's public lands and outdoor recreation within Utah in particular. So thank you for the opportunity to share some of those examples and thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak today. And thank you, more, more importantly, for contributing that data which has made it possible. Sure, there are. Come in. Hello, is this on? Yes. Um, thanks, I'm Tony, by the way. Thanks very much for a very interesting talk. I particularly resonated with your point about place and context. I think that was an awesome point to start with. It's okay, Todd, you don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to do that. Um, and, and, you know, I, I was really heartened actually to see the work that you were doing, like getting human beings in the room and asking them about their experience on public lands, because I think that that's a really missing component to a lot of planning that's happening in other places that I'm familiar with. But the thing that I want to challenge a little bit that I'm curious about what you think is the, the research that you reported on regarding the changing patterns in use with regard to changing climate. I think, and I you know, would be happy to be corrected on this, but temperature is one of obviously very many variables that could go into somebody's changing preferences. And I, I wanna ask you about your use of the word demand, because you suggested that demand was changing based on temperature. And I would, I would argue from my personal experience that actually it's not the demand that's changing, it's the opportunities that are available that's changing based on temperature. People's demand is likely uh, changing in a different way or maybe using different dynamics than just the temperature. So. I, but th I, this, I thought of this because I looked at, I looked at Colorado in the winter on your chart, and I said, well, what about precipitation? Like, what about snow? You know, how how will that impact changes in uh, people's ability to recreate? And that's not necessarily linked directly to temperature. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts generally about doing that kind of modeling, which no doubt has value, but also incorporating, you know, people's individual conceptions of their own demand and their desire to be in these landscapes and how that might change non-linearly or, or in a complex way with environmental change, um, in, including the, the concepts of you know, emerging modalities of outdoor recreation, like you know, things that we can't necessarily anticipate becoming very popular and, and those having different relationships than the ones we already see with, with the environment. So it'd be great if you could comment on um, how you see that moving forward. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and it's a complex relationship between temperature and any outdoor recreation or any human behavior outside. Generally, the way that we, we think about it in outdoor recreation is that there's three primary pathways in which it affects the ability of people to get outside, whether or not you call that demand or just participation. Uh, one is your actual, actually that temperature affecting the individual. Is it thermally uh, comfortable to actually participate in that activity? So that's a direct impact. There's also these indirect impacts that you're talking about. Uh, is that activity actually being able to being able to be participated in because the environment might have changed as a result? So we might see decreased stream flows because of increased temperatures, or increased variable, more variable stream flows because of increased precipitation rates. 
Um, and that will also imp impact uh, behavior in some way. And there's also a third stream, which is a lot more ob obtuse, and these, these policy relationships or the even economic mechanisms that influence our ability to participate in outdoor recreation. We all see the gas prices increase a little bit in the summer months, and that's an influence of, of, of supply chain logistics and actually getting gas to fuel stations, but it's also a, a function of the demand for those locations, but it also makes outdoor recreation more difficult to participate in because it's in the summer months because it's more expensive. So there are some of these relationships that are very difficult to actually tease out. And, and so in some of our analysis like this one, we're able to do it at a very big geographic scale. We're not actually able to pin down which of those individual pathways is affecting people, um, but it is affecting people through one of them. Um, and the, in the aggregate, this is kind of what, what we would expect the outcome to be. Thanks. One more question over here. Thanks, my name is Martin. Um, I, you pointed out, of course, that OSM data is not comprehensive or, com um, or what you ideally would want it to be. Was there specific things looking at OSM data that you incorporated that you would think, like, I wish you had more of that, or I wish this would be better worked out by us as a community? Uh, generally, just the, the completeness uh, of the attributional data that is within that is within op OpenStreetMaps. I think that was the biggest thing that we faced, particularly we're looking at these large swaths of federal lands where, where there was really no um, data on particularly social trails. Uh, we had no information, oftentimes, and obviously in the, in the OSM database, we know that there's a trail there, we know that there's a campsite there, but all, very often and frequently in many of our rural locations in like the southeastern portion of the state, it's just the point location, or it's just the line feature, and absolutely no attributional data. I didn't even know the, the name of that camp site. So that's why I'm saying it's, it's not entirely perfect, but I, I know that the community is working um, very hard to actually validate a lot of those things, uh, particularly through, through trails, the, o, the OSM US uh, Trails Initiative is a great start there, but trails are just one part of a huge array of out outdoor recreation assets and that actually do need to be mapped. So it's, it's a great start, and we'll maybe lay the groundwork for actually trying to define how we do that in a very efficient way at scale. I think we should end on that. That was great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jordan. Thanks.